Joe Biden is an elderly man with poor memory. Uh, I know it, you know it, everybody knows it. Make sure everyone around you is aware in case they are too dumb to know it. It's stewdoesmerch.com. You get the t-shirt, you get the mug. Use the code stew10 for 10% off. You can also check out the show on YouTube at youtube.com slash stewdoesamerica. Be sure to like and comment on the videos and hit the bell for notifications. Tim Carney is here to tell us why we're all trying too hard at parenting. NBC backtracks on their hiring of RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel in the most predictable story of all time. Uh, but we've got the RFK vice presidential announcement. So much going on today. We're going to start by doing the progressive gold rush. And this is going to seem to you like a monologue about abortion and the Supreme Court. But I, I promise you it's actually not. It really isn't. It, now, that's an incredibly important issue to me and, and eh, I think likely to you as well. Uh, the issue of life, you know that in front of the Supreme Court today, there was a big uh, argument, the Supreme Court hearing arguments over access to the abortion pill. We're talking Mifeprestone, yeah! One of our, all of our favorite abortion pill, uh, you know, there's a bunch of abortion pills in the market, but we're all pro Mifeprestone, right? Um, let me give you a t just a taste of what we got here in front of the Supreme Court. This is the uh, United States Solicitor General arguing on the uh, pro-choice side of this particular argument. Here's her uh, final statement. I think it's worth stepping back finally and thinking about the profound mismatch between that theory of, um, of injury and the remedy that respondents obtained. They have said that they fear that there might be some emergency room doctor somewhere, someday, who might be presented with some woman who is suffering an incredibly rare complication and that the doctor might have to provide treatment notwithstanding the conscience protections. We don't think that harm is materialized, but what the court did to guard against that very remote risk is enter sweeping nationwide relief that restricts access to mifepristone for every single woman in this country, and that causes profound harm. It harms the agency, which had the federal courts come in and displace the agency's scientific judgments. It harms the pharmaceutical industry, which is sounding alarm bells in this case and oh, saying no. that this would destabilize the system for approving and regulating <laughs> drugs. And it harms women who need access to medication abortion under the conditions that FDA determined were safe and effective. I, um... The court should reverse and remand with instructions to dismiss to conclusively end this litigation. I got to admit, my brain hurts a little bit from this. I, I, there's so much in there that I would love to just sit here and pick apart. We don't have time to go through uh, all of it. I will say it is fascinating to just listen to how concerned the left now is in protecting the pharmaceutical industry. I, what I've been doing this show for uh, this show and various others for 20 years. When did this change? I can't I, I can't keep track of it anymore. For my entire life, it was people like Bernie Sanders saying how evil the, the pharmaceutical industry was. And now they're just like arguing in front of the Supreme Court, we need to protect the interests of the pharmaceutical industry. I, I can't keep track of it. By the way, I don't think there's much chance at all of, of this coming out the right way, the way that I would prefer it to come out uh, from the pro-life side of the argument. The Supreme Court seems unlikely to restrict access to the abortion pill. What you seem to be getting is all the Trump justices um, going along with the left-wing argument here. At least that's what uh, it seems to be projected from opening arguments. They're all pretty skeptical. Of course, John Roberts, you know which way he's going on an issue like this. I mean, it does seem like the, the the court was looking for something after overturning Roe versus Wade uh, to kind of come to everybody and say, see, we're still fair. We're not going to rule every time on the pro-life side because who would want to rule every time in favor of life? <laughs> come on, that's really overdoing it, guys. Um, so I, it does seem like this is one that they're going to go the opposite way on. But as I told you, this is not actually about abortion. But stay with me, because, of course, we had the liberal complaints. They are just terrified of what this ruling could mean. I mean, is it going to ban all abortions? Is it going to ban all women? Are we going to go to a womanless society? Of course, we can't define what a woman is, so I don't know how we would know that we're in one. But who knows? Here's a stupid Cory Bush. The Supreme Court is hearing oral arguments in a case that could lead to the ban of mifepristone, one of two drugs used for medication abortion in our country. Oh, no. This tiny package is what all of the fuss is about. Yeah, mifepristone that tiny package that kills kids. Oh. The two types of pills in this packet <laughs> have been FDA approved for 23 years. Really? It's 23 safe, years? It's effective and it's the most common type of abortion. Oh, good. Now, let's get one thing clear. Oh, yeah, let's do it. This court can't stop us. No matter what these far right judges say Wait, we aren't going to let anyone strip away our rights Wait, i'm sorry not what? in missouri hmm. not anywhere st louis 
I'll keep fighting to expand access to life-saving health care like abortion care because it is a human right. This tiny little package is what we're arguing. They never say that when there's a gun. Like, this tiny little gun is what we're arguing about. Can you believe that? No, 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 no. In that case, I guess the size doesn't matter that much. Um, uh, by the way, is she just saying she's going to, to ignore the court's ruling if it doesn't come out on her side? Now, that's, of course, what I would expect out of Cori Bush, but it is fascinating when we have the left wing constantly telling us about how important our institutions are these days. Um, Kathy Hochul is also a moron, and here she is talking about the same thing. It's one thing to provide abortion services, but if they outlaw the distribution of mifepristone as a result of the Supreme Court decision, which we'll hear about in June, if they go that far then what options do I have? I have 150,000 doses stockpiled, but it should not come to this. And we are becoming now a state of, of haves and haves not. Some states have freedom, some do not based on your governor. Some governors. do not? But what? if this Supreme Court listens what? to these ju this judge in Amarillo, Texas, of all places, of all places to Texas? dictate to all of us that our freedoms that we fought for for decades and decades uh, are gone. Decades and decades. I'm gonna I tell you this. Don't underestimate the rage of women in this country. Rage! They will march. Woman they will rage. take to the streets. They will protest. And there <laughs> will be electoral consequences. <gasps> Electoral consequences, that's what women of rage do. I just want to remind you the timeline we're talking about. They've, uh, these have been approved for 23 years. Um, these are rights we've been fighting for for decades. Keep that in the back of your uh, mind for a second. And I, I should apologize for something. I called both of the last two people stupid. And that's not, that's not right. Uh, well, I mean, it's right, but it's not kind. I want to be a better person. I, should, I shouldn't do that. And the problem with calling you know, everyone who comments on the left stupid is that when you really have something from Bette Midler, you have no other word to go to because there's nobody dumber than Bette Midler. She says, SCOTUS is now hearing oral arguments to restrict mifeprestone pills used for medication abortion, even though they have been found to find as safe as Viagra. So the men keep get, get to keep raising their wieners, but you'll get stuck raising their babies. Now... That's, wow, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. It's the left-wing visions of families that have the women raising the babies on their own. God, conservatives are the ones that want there to be a nuclear family, but that's when the complaint benefits you in any individual second, you use it and then ignore it later on. That's the way the left operates. Now, this is so fascinating, these, 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 uh, these clips. We just play for you from very dumb people. Um, uh, Restrict mifeprestone pills. Okay, then you get that one. Kathy Hochul, they've been uh, looking for this for, they've been fighting for these rights for decades. They've been fighting for these rights for 23 years, says Cori Bush. And it's been approved, excuse me, for 23 years. But has it been? Because what they're talking about in front of the, the Supreme Court, and remember, this is not about abortion. This is not actually about abortion. What they've been talking about in front of the Supreme Court is not about restricting mifeprestone. It's not about something they fought for for 23 years. It's not about something that's been approved for 23 years or been fought for for decades. Where did this thing come from? Let me take you way back in history. This is the actual thing being challenged in front of the Supreme Court. The FDA will permanently allow abortion pills by mail. Date on the article, December 16th, 2021. Well, wait a minute. December 16th, 2021. That's not something that has been going on for 23 years or something they've been fighting for for decades. In fact, it's not even something that is about restricting access. Hmm. Where does this refer to? Why is it being made into permanent uh, status? Let's go back. April 13th, 2021. New York Times. FDA will allow abortion pills by mail during the pandemic. Wait a minute. I sense a theme here that we've been seeing in so many other facets of life. See, what's up there is not 23 years or 50 years or multiple decades of fighting for women's rights to kill their kids. What we're talking about here is a pandemic era uh, allowance for people to receive abortion pills in the mail without ever going to the doctor. What they wanted to do 
is what they said back in April of 2021 was, hey, you know what? This COVID thing has been going on. We really, I mean, the doctor's hard to get to. They might get sick. They might get COVID. We can't let that happen. They shouldn't have to go to the doctors to get these pills actually prescribed. We should just mail them to everybody without even going over any of the potential problems or any of the, uh, the potential side effects. We should just mail them out. And of course, look, we were in a pandemic. Things were weird, right? We had to all change the way things were. So they gave us the pitch. This is temporary. It's just for the pandemic. And then a few months later in December, it's put in as a final permanent rule by Biden's FDA. And then just a few years later, we're in front of the Supreme Court and everyone's acting as if they unwound a law that started for the pandemic in 2021, as if that rule were reversed, we'd be going back to the Stone Ages. This is what they do. Try to find that in the mainstream media as they cover this. Try it. Because they are not telling you that at all. They're acting as if this would be, I mean, the media is covering this as if it were uh, the, the Handmaid's Tale in action. This thing that they, remember, they're all upset about Roe versus Wade going away. But yet now they're, they're looking back to the time when Roe versus Wade existed and they didn't have these pills delivered by mail without a doctor's appointment as if it's the Stone Ages when we were just hearing what that was the glory days. According to these, pieces, these same people, that those times were the glory days of women's rights, and now they've all been taken away. They made access to this pill in this fashion only during the pandemic that was supposed to be a temporary allowance, which, of course, Biden's FDA made official later on as permanent. And that's the thing to remember here. That's why this isn't about abortion. What it's about is never letting a crisis go to waste. It's about looking at an opportunity of what we saw with COVID and utilizing it to every single degree possible. The left used COVID to force through every one of their little wishes that they had for years and years and years and years and years. All these things that they wanted, they decided to use COVID as an excuse for, and then they want to make them permanent. And then they go back later on and say, you can't unwind these things. This would be going backwards. We'd be reversing rights for people. Women didn't have this access until December of 2021 in any permanent way. So why is it so Stone Age to go back to the era before, which again, would not be restricting these pills at all. The only thing it would do would be that women went to the doctor to get access to them. Does that sound that crazy, does it? This is what they're doing with so many different aspects of society though. I mean, voting is a great uh, idea. You know, oh, well, uh, we, we just need access to people to mail in their ballots because of COVID. Because of COVID, you see, people are sick. They can't be standing in those lines next to each other. And then they get inside those little booths. There's going to be COVID all over the place. It's going to be invading their nostrils. You know how that goes. So we're going to do mail-in balloting everywhere. We're going to have ballot harvesting. So people can, can go to nursing homes and gather up all the ballots and affect a few little citizens. And sure, they're probably dead by the time the vote actually counts. But that's a whole other story. Luckily, Andrew Cuomo is there to end our old age problems. And... At the end of the day, we're going to put those in. Sure, we're going to get a bunch of people going to nursing homes, doing some ballot harvesting, dropping off the ballots at 3 a.m. in an unmarked, uh, unprotected uh, ballot box. That's totally fine because COVID. And now when you after COVID passes and everyone says that doesn't sound like such a good idea, maybe we should reverse that. <gasps> you're sending us back to the Stone Age. I can't believe you're doing this. You're restricting voting rights. You don't even care. The left is like, this is going to be devastating for women. How? They have to go to the doctor? I mean, I don't like the doctor that much, but I don't think it's devastating for your rights to have to go to the doctor to get a prescription. You know, the way we've all been operating our entire lives to get prescription medication. What do you do? You go to the doctor. They write you the prescription. You pick it up at the pharmacy. That's how it's been going. And now I hesitate to actually call mifeprestone a medication because that's not what it is. But whatever, you understand the point I'm making here. And we, act, we go down this route with all the mainstream media coverage of how can we live in an era where women can't you know, end the lives of their children? What, what will we do? I mean, it sounds terrifying, I know, but maybe like going to a doctor for something like this is a good thing. 
Maybe. And think about how many times the left has done this with COVID. Voting rights. They, all the voting rights expansions they dreamed of for years and years and years, they put them in as temporary for COVID and then made them permanent. How about um, uh, student loan uh, reduction? They wanted that forever. They put it in. Now they're largely making it permanent. They tried to make it completely permanent until the Supreme Court overruled it. Um, eviction moratoriums. They wanted the eviction moratoriums for years and years and years and years. And they put that in. Over and over and over and over again, they put things in as temporary measures during COVID and then just expanded them or made them permanent afterward and argued that if we went to the time before COVID, you know, 2020, we were turning back the clock to a time where women or men or whoever didn't have rights. It's nonsense. And if we don't call them out on it, we're going to wind up losing many of our rights. I think in a decade, progressives are going to look back at the COVID era as a progressive gold rush. All of their wildest dreams coming true day after day after day. They wanted, they wanted an opportunity like this. Now, no one wants a, a pandemic to show up. But the left has done something, and this goes back to the Obama era where they talked about it openly. They've done things like the way they utilized the financial crisis and the way they utilized COVID. When they saw an opportunity to grab every little bit of power, every little uh, giveaway that they could possibly get their hands on, when they saw a tragedy, they didn't see it as a tragedy. They saw it as an opportunity. The progressive gold rush has been on for years. We've been talking about it for years. And once again, it looks like they're going to try to make another part of it permanent in your life. Okay, maybe it was a little bit about abortion, but mostly it wasn't, I swear. Uh, let me tell you about Constitution Wealth. This is the Patriot's Choice in Wealth Management. Let's talk about the pro-life issue for a second. Maybe you're somebody who feels passionately about that. And you look at your investment portfolio, you've got a, you know, a couple hundred grand, maybe you sold a house, you've got some money in the bank, you're looking towards your uh, retirement, and you have a, an investment advisor who's continually putting you in companies that support the pro-choice side, donate some of your money to the pro-choice side of the argument. What do you do? You can't not have an advisor. You want to have an advisor, but what do you do? Well, Constitution Wealth is the answer to this question. They can help you build a solid investment plan because, you know, you have to retire someday, but they can reduce your investments in ESG and DEI and all sorts of stuff. I mean, whether you might not like gambling, you're going to get your money out of that realm. That's pretty much everywhere these days. Uh, how about the pro-life side of things? You want to make sure you're, you're not investing in a company that's dumping money into, uh, you know, pro-choice uh, causes. Whatever the reason is, you need to have someone who understands you. Because I got news for you. You go to one of these big houses, they're going to come to you and they're going to say, look, I don't know what you're talking about. This is ESG is the way of the future. Well, maybe that's not for you. And if you have 250000 or more of stock and bond investments and would like to reduce your exposure to woke companies and make sure your voting rights go the right way, that's a big part of this. you got to share. That is a vote. If you hand it over to some big company that's voting for all the woke stuff, you are helping that side. Constitution Wealth can stop that for you. And if enough people come together, we can make a real difference here. ConstitutionWealth.com slash do. ConstitutionWealth.com slash do. Get a consultation set up today. It's ConstitutionWealth.com slash do. There's a new book out called Family Unfriendly, How Our Culture Made Raising Kids Much Harder Than It Needs to Be. And uh, let me read from it for a second. Spending every minute supervising, planning, driving, and fretting, and spending every dime on training, enriching, and keeping kids busy isn't high-quality parenting. It's just following the dumb rules of a family-unfriendly culture. The author is Tim Carney, and he's a senior fellow with the American Ent Enterprise Institute, a columnist for the Washington Examiner, and he is the author of this new book, Family Unfriendly. Tim, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, it was interesting reading your book uh, because uh, the kind of the example you use of this sort of over-parenting type of thing that you talk about in the book is an uh, example with your son playing 12U Select Baseball and as I'm reading it, my son is about to have a practice of 12 U select baseball. So I am like <laughs> square in your target audience for sure. And I, it's a really interesting concept. I think it's an important book because it's I think we do lose sight of important things when we get in this sort of rat race of parenting. Can you kind of describe the thesis of the book? You, you do it well with the difference between you know Friday night lights and the travel team trap. 
Absolutely. So the, the reason I wanted to write this book is I see a huge increase in childhood anxiety, a huge decrease in the birth rate. People are delaying marriage, parents are more stressed. And so rather than just say, you know, buck up everybody, have more kids, save the planet, I try to make uh, look at what's making the culture harder. And Friday Night Lights was this t-ball program that we stumbled upon. I thought it was like youth sports, get my kid an early start on baseball, right? And then I realized the t-ball the was an afterthought. The thing was everybody brings all their kids and then ignores them while they run around on the back campus of a Catholic school. There's semi-legal alcohol for the adults. There's a snack shack selling burgers and hot dogs for everybody. The older kids are playing basketball. And the kids are being ignored and having fun. And that's what we need. <laughs> the rise in childhood anxiety is because they get programmed every minute of every day. They're always being supervised. They don't have time to ride their bike around the neighborhood and come home when the streetlights come on. I also think it goes deeper. The, uh, the dating and mating culture is broken. The values of our culture aren't given to sort of real lifelong commitment. But I wanted to start on those baseball fields of Friday night lights versus the travel team where the coach said to my 12-year-old, baseball isn't fun. Winning baseball is fun. <laughs> and so that's the contrast I wanted to draw. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting going through a lot of this. I mean, myself, it's like, you, you, I, I, and I'm, I try to be on alert for it. You know, you, you're not trying to turn your kid into the next Shohei Otani. You're trying to have the kid have fun and learn things that are important and make sure that they're enjoying their childhood. But there is that pressure and you feel like, Am I a bad parent if I don't buy that really expensive bat? Am I a bad parent if I don't put them in, you know, the private lessons that might help them succeed a little bit more? And you talk about the idea that maybe we're doing a little too much in parenting. I mean, that's a somewhat controversial statement. What do you mean by it? Well, and it's directly what I'm pushing back on. You quoted my word quality. Um, I encountered while researching family unfriendly these demographers who say, well, our birth rate is low because parents in wealthy countries are choosing quality over quantity. My wife and I have six kids. I don't think we've chosen low <laughs> quality, but we haven't chosen the highest quality piano teacher. There's a girl who lived around the corner who was willing to come over and sit down at this used piano and teach our kids. So we did it for a couple of years. We haven't chosen the highest quality baseball. That one time we tried to, it turned out to be a disaster. And so what, what I mean is that you uh, give your kids independence because that's good for them, but you worry about family culture. So this is where I sometimes think that we've let this kind of capitalism is the right economic system, but we let the logic of capitalism sneak into our cultural or social arrangements. And so we are almost too individualistic, build this kid up, and we create these child-friendly families or child-centered families instead of family-centered families. And so it's super planned, hyper-organized. And it's not good for anybody. And I do think the birth rate is lower today, in part because we, we ran focus groups. And there are a lot of young men, you know, young adults who said, I, I won't be ready to have kids for a long time because I want to make sure I give them the best of everything. That's that's not realistic. And it's not what's going to make everybody the most happy. Yeah. And you talk about, too, about how the uh, the maybe the increase in helicopter parenting, uh, where your parents are constantly looking over every decision and trying to micromanage their kids' lives sort of is a, it has a close relation to the fact that we have fewer children, right? Like you, you, when you have a large oh, yeah. family, you, you can't do that physically. So you just don't. You can't be a secret. You can't be a secret service agent to six kids. <laughs> right. And so I've actually I've written a piece that I, I pitched to the Washington Post. Hopefully they'll run it. The headline, make your life easier, have four kids. And <laughs> this is based in part on my life, but based on actual studies. The funniest thing about researching this book is finding the studies to prove what my mom could have told me <laughs> before I asked any of these questions. But one of them is when you have fewer, when you have more kids, the older kids look after the younger ones. You abandon this myth that you can, you know, take your kid to travel tournaments in Delaware and North Carolina every weekend. And you abandon this, this, this idea that you need to be a secret service agent to your kids. And so this, in some ways, I really am trying to be countercultural because this isn't something you'll hear a lot, but yeah, getting married kind of young, having a bunch of kids, really laying down your life for your your spouse and your kids that this is going to make people happy and we know this because this is what has worked for hundreds of years this is what sort of america was built on but this sort of hyper planned super intelligent very kind of sterilized life is what we think is 
the modern way to do it. In this more secular culture, we think, oh, now we've overcome the old fashioned ways of doing it. But a lot of the old fashioned ways like, hey, kid, uh, ride your bike around the neighborhood, come home when the streetlights turn on. A lot of those made everybody happier. Yeah, and that was, I mean, that's how I grew up. I feel like you, you talk about Gen X in the book, and like that was kind of the Gen X way of growing up, right? You came back, you, you I mean, we, all we did was pick up games, we played sports all the time, but it was, ne- you know, not nearly as organized yeah. as it is today. I will say, as a parent, like, I knew how I grew up, and things turned out at least somewhat okay. Uh, but it is, I, I will say in practice, it's somewhat hard to implement. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I think of my kid like walking across town two miles to his friend's house. And it's like, that seems completely bonkers to me, even though I know intellectually he'd be fine. We live in a safe community. It's much safer now than it was when I was a kid. Why is there that disconnect? I think a lot of it has to do with our absorption of the media, social media, just mass media, even before then, something terrible happens to some kid once a day in America, but in our brains, it feels like it's happening right around us. So we think the odds are high of that. And then we just come to accept certain risks and disregard others. Like, you know, driving on the on a three lane highway with your kid at night is actually more dangerous than letting him walk alone around the neighborhood or the idea of leaving your kid in a parking lot in a car, your 10 year old and your eight year old. Oh my gosh, the worst thing you could ever do is leave your kid in the car because people associate any leaving a kid in the car with leaving a newborn in a 90 degree day. And like there are certain things that we just decided this is absolutely your fault if anything bad happens, you can't cross that risk. So just these cultural stories have gotten spun that have no uh, no real correlation with actual risks to your kids. And again, I do think it has to do with a broader mindset. And in the later chapters, I get into that sort of the philosophy of, um, are we just individuals or are we really, do we belong in a community? Can we plan our life or is life kind of inherently chaotic? Um, so uh, kind of a grand question here. How is this all working out for us? Like, I mean, I, it feels <laughs> like it's not working out to me, but I mean, is that what the research shows as well? Absolutely. The record high childhood anxiety has been traced again and again to the lack of independent play. Kids need to not be supervised at every minute. It's making them more anxious. And guess what? A society with fewer kids turns out to be a sadder society. And I looked at all the, all the data on this and then it goes, it spirals down. People who don't have children around. You don't need your children around, but you need somebody's children around. Somebody has to do this. People without children around, not just the economic problems, they're sadder, they have less hope for the future. Sadder, less hope for the future results in fewer kids. So we can look at places like South Korea, which they're below one baby per woman. We fell from 2.1 in 2006 down to 1.6, 1.7 now. And so this downward spiral Besides the economic cost, it makes us sadder, makes us less hopeful. It makes us less trusting of one another. People, (laughs) this is one of my favorite stats, people, men or women, when they are expecting their first child, become less likely to commit crimes. That is, all of us are kind of broken, fallen creatures. We become a little better when we become parents. Mm. How much difference can you make in your kid's life? I mean, you cut part of the book, you kind of describe that, you know, maybe not as much as you think. Certainly, you cannot make your kid be uh, get a Division One scholarship in sports just by trying really hard. Yeah. Um, but I, I cite Brian Kaplan, who wrote a book called Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, and he points out that nature is going to be a huge part of it. Just some kids are going to be more academically oriented. Some kids are going to get luckier. Some kids are going to be more athletically oriented, and you just can't push them that hard. I talked to an athletic director named Dan who told me, I was like, I, I don't like the fact that, you know, my Charlie is competing against all these guys who have their own private pitching coach and they're playing baseball year round. We can't afford that. He was like, yeah, Charlie's not going to, he might be out of luck, but so are those other kids because some other super talented kid is going to come in and take the starting job of that other boy whose entire childhood was dedicated to that. You don't have that much control over your kids' outcomes. What you can do is you can give them more independent play. You can give them an example, hey, mom and dad, they kind of have fun. <laughs> they have a fun life. Let's, uh, I want to have kids too. Mm. Um, I, I think as a conservative in good standing, I, I did cringe a little bit at seeing the it takes a village phrase, <laughs> um, which I think is okay. But I think the way you're talking about it, I'm okay with it. Can you kind of give us a brief explainer about how, how what you mean yes. by that? 
So when Hillary Clinton said it takes a village to raise a child, I think she meant the Department of Health and Human <laughs> Services. She <laughs> wanted government programs to do it. Every parent will tell you they need support. We need support from neighbors. We need support from grandma, from your mother-in-law. We need support from your sis- your younger sisters-in-law who are going to babysit and from your older nieces who are going to babysit. And for us, our support system is revolves around church communities, Catholic schools, our local congregations. And that what we need is a mentor. Who, we can say, oh, wait a second. You can have a bunch of kids. You, oh, wait, you can let your kid play unattended there. Oh, wait, yes, it is really hard when the baby's not sleeping through the night, but, but you get through that. All of that support that we need, whether it's mentoring or modeling or babysitting or someone to bring us meals when you have a baby or when somebody gets sick, all and or just to be a voice of sanity for you to say, does your child also wipe his nose on the fridge? The, these That's absolutely necessary to raising kids. A nuclear family is the most important institution in the world, but it's not sufficient to raising a kid. Hmm. Uh, uh, before I let you go, I was uh, maybe my favorite part of the book was you. You talk about um, a lesson your son Charlie learned in a game where he threw to the wrong base and uh, made an error and wound up, uh, you know, costing the team the game. My favorite part though was the footnote you put in that Charlie said <laughs> he wanted everyone to know that he also made really good plays and won games too. So uh, I yes, mean, yes. I so, could totally see my son doing the exact same thing. book as well. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Carney, the new book. It's great, by the way. Uh, Family Unfriendly, how our culture makes uh, made raising kids much harder than it needs to be. Be sure to grab a copy wherever you can, uh, because uh, it's an important read. And it's, it's about rethinking the way we're doing things. And obviously, that's something we need to be doing. Tim, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you. And now for the most predictable end of a story in history. Ronna McDaniel going to be dropped by MSNBC. (laughs) Yes, MSNBC is going in NBC News dropping ex-RNC chair Ronna McDaniel after Rachel Maddow and Morning Joe (laughs) revolts. I mean, this is the dumbest story of all time. You know, I actually feel kind of bad for Ronna McDaniel. She's a she just got no friends left, right? Like, you know, the, the left, this was what was supposed to happen here is she was an ex-Trump official getting a job at, uh, you know, NBC News. She was going to be the one they'd go to and that she would say things that are critical of Trump or something. And and then people would be like, oh, wow, we finally have, this is, the, what is it, Alyssa Farah? Is that her name? I don't know. I can't remember her name. But the lady that's on The View, I think. Alyssa Farrah Griffin, I'm being told. Um, you know, that was her kind of shtick, right? You come in, you're in the Trump administration, then you leave the Trump administration, you say some critical things, and then they're like, wow, there's finally one good one on the right. And you're only the good one on the right when you say bad things about the right. That's how this whole thing works. But now she's been booted from MSNBC. And what's interesting about this is she was like, you know, Donald Trump's handpicked person uh, to run the RNC. She fell out of favor with the base, and so now... Trump doesn't really like her and it doesn't seem like any of the MAGA people like her very much. And then the left doesn't like her either. I mean, she's now, uh, it's just embarrassing. And like, how desperate is MSNBC to keep an opposing view off their airwaves? Like, they just, they can't, like, Ronna McDaniel is not even like someone embraced by conservatives or the right. And they can't even let her go on, on the air and just occasionally say something mildly positive about Donald Trump. I mean, I, fascinating fascinating they don't even hide it they not only they just want you gone like from the river to the sea no conservatives uh, will be seen that's what they want uh they, it's it's just like they can't even hear you speak there's uh, we hear liberals speak all the time i just read you uh you know three or four really dumb things from liberals uh, in the beginning of the show we want to hear what they say they apparently don't uh, want the uh, want, don't want that to happen um, RFK Jr. is uh, he's now picking his R- uh, VP pick that is, uh, this happened today. And it looks like it's going to be um, a uh, Nicole Shanahan. Now, the most predictable thing in the world, of course, was also it was not going to be Aaron Rodgers. It was never going to be Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers just gets in the news for whatever he does all the time. That's the Aaron Rodgers thing. He says he's going to do some big thing. And then I don't know. I mean, he, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. But at the end of the day, there's the Aaron Rodgers hype on every story is just unbearable. Like, let, let the guy play football. Just let him go play football. 
We don't need to hear about every twist and turn in his life. RFK Jr., of course, brought this up, uh, and also with Jesse Ventura as a possibility. Winds up going with uh, Nicole Shanahan. You might be like, why? Um, Well, you might know Nicole Shanahan. Nicole Shanahan best known for being married to Sergey Brin of Google. So they, they are no longer married. In fact, the breakup was something you may have heard about in the news. There was rumors that she had an affair on Sergey Brin with Elon Musk. So she swims in some rich circles, and if you need a lot of money donated to an independent campaign, maybe having Nicole Shanahan be your VP is a good way to go. Uh, She did, by the way, donate a bunch of money to RFK already. She seems to uh, be very aligned with him uh, as far as his views go, of course. Uh, But also, you know, the fact that maybe there's a little self-funding thing there, maybe not a bad choice for a third-party candidate. Honestly, the way that these rules are set up for third-party candidates getting on the ballot you can't blame anyone who would put, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, someone at least a multimillionaire on the ballot to helpfully uh, help with the costs a little bit. Uh, and uh, another person who's not going to who so, went from someone with like the biggest money troubles in the world last week. Everyone said he was going to go bankrupt last week. So now the guy with no financial problems at all, you might know him as Donald J. Trump. Truth Social has gone public. It is trading. It is up a lot today. Um, and uh, his his share uh, currently valued at three point nine billion dollars. I believe that's before before today. It went up a bunch today. Now, it's hard to know really if that's going to hang around. Look, Truth Social is not exactly lighting the world on fire in the social media realm. Uh, basically, it exists as a place for Donald Trump to post his posts, which then get ripped from Truth Social and posted on Twitter and all the other platforms. It doesn't have a huge active user base. There's no real reason for, honestly, it to be worth you know $9 billion as a company, um, which is what the rumor is uh, today. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see the final numbers of where it closed. But the bottom line is it's not really seemingly that strong of a company per se, but a lot of people are buying shares to support Donald Trump. And, and this is a good way to do it because uh, if he can overturn one rule, there's a rule that says I think he has to wait six months uh, to sell his shares. But uh, if he can uh, overturn that, which he probably will be able to internally, uh, he can access a lot of this money earlier, and that will help him spend on the campaign, supposedly, or on his legal bills or whatever he needs it for. So uh, there you go. Uh, Truth Social, a big day in the initial debut uh, on the uh, stock exchange. And, you know, it is one of those things that uh, Trump always does si- find a way. It, it seems to be he's blessed with the dumbest enemies uh, of all time and really good timing when it comes to money. Uh, this is a very well-timed windfall, and it should help him, hopefully, he looks at this and says, hey, this is money and maybe I didn't expect so much. This is money we can spend on making sure Joe Biden doesn't win the presidency again. We will see. When you have to buy or sell a home and maybe you don't have a $6 billion windfall coming your way, you want realestateagentsitrust.com. Now look, anytime you have a a home that's being bought or sold, this is one of the biggest financial transactions you'll ever make in your entire life. Uh, Usually as you go through life, these numbers kind of increase, right? Like you have maybe a starter home and then the home gets a little bit bigger and you get some kids and it moves into a bigger place and you get your earnings to your peak earnings and maybe you go a little bit bigger. And as this goes on, you need to make sure you don't make mistakes because each time you trade a house for another, you're talking about real risk to your financial future, money that you can depend on later on in life. The agents that real estate agents I trust work with are the best in your area, no matter where you are. They're top sellers. They know the lay of the land. They know the best practices to get you and your family where you need to go, whether you know it's across the street or across the country. Most of these agents are fans of the show, so you got to have something in common with them. I mean, assuming you like the show. Maybe you hate the show and they like the show, so maybe you won't have anything to talk about. But the bottom line is you can then fight about whether Studios America sucks or not. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. It's a free service to you. Check it out. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Well, you remember when Joe Biden was really fired up about the border and all of a sudden he became a big border hawk and we were supposed to somehow believe that after watching him in public life for a half a century? Well, Biden was planning executive action on the border. Now he's gone silent. 
shockingly, um, the month ago, the White House was openly considering a string of executive actions to curb migration at the southern border, but no announcements were made. And now immigration advocates who have been engaged with the Biden administration about the move say they no longer appear imminent. What a shock. It's almost like he didn't mean it at the time. Huh. The administration's change in posture is owed, in fact, in, in, excuse me, in part to the downtick in migration. The quote, they're in pretty uh, they're in that pretty classic mode of nothing's on fire right now, said an immigration policy advocate granted anonymity to discuss private conversations about the administration's border policy considerations. Huh. Nothing's on fire right now. So that's why they're not doing anything on the border. Of course, they never wanted to do anything about the border. Anyone. Anyone who knows anything would know that, and I don't believe that it fooled a person in the world, but they said it anyway. And they said, now nothing's on fire, so they don't have to do anything. Hmm. Well, then you have this. February's data shows a new record high for Biden's border invasion. Uh, The highest month of February ever in recorded history. But nothing's on fire right now. No, no. Now, of course, the numbers are slightly down. A good reason, a chunk of the reason for that, number one is seasonality. As if you compare February to every other February, you see this is the highest ever. So seasonality would, would, uh, would show a little bit of the drop. The other part is, and, and this is science here, I don't mean to go over your head. If I'm talking over your head, give me a second. I'll try to explain it in, in real world terms. But February is shorter than the other months. And that's confirmed. We've confirmed that with authorities. Back in a second. Before we go, let me um, take you on a a, a roller coaster ride, a roller coaster ride of a headline. This is going to be an adventure for you. Are you ready for it? Halle Berry details herpes scare. That was actually perimenopause in conversation with First Lady Jill Biden. That that's a hell of a headline. So what the story is that Halle Berry talked about herpes, but not actually herpes. She thought she had herpes, but it was actually something else. And she was talking to Jill Biden at the time. So there you go. Uh, She said that she. She uh, thought she wasn't going to have uh, menopause, which, I, you know, that's an interesting theory. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it happened at a, a conversation about women's health, which apparently they've identified what women are, which is great. It has, seemed to have something to do with these body parts they keep referencing. I don't know how they came up with this, uh, but she said um, she was uh, she started having sex with her with her man and their doctor told her she had the worst case of herpes he'd ever seen. And then they tested and they didn't even have herpes. I think that might not have been a doctor, Holly. I just want to let you. Is it possible you just is it possible you just ran into Jeffy in a back alley and he and he was wearing something? He likes to play doctor, but he's not actually a doctor, just so you know. And also we have the Strippers Bill of Rights, also known as Jeffy's Law, uh, signed into law in Washington State. Strippers are workers and they should have the same rights and protections as any other labor force. Um, she said that uh, one of the spokespeople said uh, she uh, strippers should not be uh, having to deal with exploitation, trafficking and abuse, which, of course, is true because human beings shouldn't have to go do that. But it's already illegal. All that stuff's already illegal. You can't just abuse people. That's not legal. But apparently Jeffy's law will 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 solve that. I don't know if our uh, new line of T-shirts will solve anything, but it will let people around, you know, that Joe Biden even though he has Jill Biden and they have been talking a lot about their sex life recently for whatever reason. But uh, he happens to be an elderly man with a poor memory. So maybe she told him not to and he keeps doing it anyway. You can't remember. You can't blame the guy. Uh, you can get the uh, merch at studosmerch.com. Code is Stu10. You'll save 10% off all your Joe Biden elderly man with a poor memory merch. We will see you tomorrow.